to Sonder. My name is Maggie. I am a knitter, spinner, bibliophile, doctor, and new mom living here in Denver, Colorado. It is Tuesday, June 7th today, and I just want to welcome everyone. It has been a very long time. I did post a little episode, um, about a week and a half, maybe two weeks ago, that showed my baby knits, and I was wearing my daughter, Edie, on my chest. She is no longer in my belly anymore. She is actually just in the other room taking a nap. So if she wakes up, <laughs> this will come to a screeching halt because much like her mother, she gets very hangry. And uh, when she wakes up from a nap, she like needs to be breastfed immediately. So just fair warning. But oh my gosh, it has been so, so long since I have seen you all and I've missed being able to see you. Um, obviously a lot has happened in my life. I had a child and that was an incredible and scary and beautiful and amazing experience all wrapped into one. Um, and other than that, I have been on maternity leave, which has been pretty amazing. Um, honestly, being a physician, I am a resident um, in a dual program here in Denver, Colorado, um, for those of you who are new. So um, I sort of switched back and forth between doing internal medicine, so being a specialist for adults in pediatrics, which is a specialist for kids, I switch back and forth between those every three months and you can't really have your residency put on hold without going on FMLA. This is a whole long thing, but anyway, it means that I do have some things that I need to work on while I'm at home with Edie. Um, and I'm just starting to do those now. <laughs> I feel like we, we get three months off and the first month and a half, but really like the first month of her life was really just me getting used to being a mother, which has been amazing, but also really hard. So I'm finally kind of back into the group of things. And so I wanted to come on and reconnect with all of you. Hopefully I will be able to come on here with more frequency, but I can't promise anything. Um, being a new mom is interesting and balancing that with being a resident physician is also interesting. So there's a lot going on, but it is a beautiful spring day nearing summer. Uh, the summer solstice is only a couple of weeks away and it definitely feels like summer now. I actually brought some harvest from our uh, garden this morning. So I will have some footage at the end of our garden. It has been growing like crazy. I really, I like applaud everyone who grows flowers, but I have such horrible allergies that for me, gardening is really just about vegetables and fruit. So this is the strawberry harvest from just one day, which is so many and the strawberries just look so so beautiful they're like bright bright red and if you have never had a strawberry fresh from the garden it is incredible it tastes so so different than the strawberries you get from the store so yeah we get about a glass or a uh, bowl this size almost every day for the next couple of months. So we end up freezing a lot of strawberries, but also eating a lot of strawberries. And then this was the first vegetable I got to harvest from the garden. And it is a zucchini. <laughs> I like to pick the zucchinis when they're still pretty small because I think they taste better. Um, and also because it can just really get out of hand. We already have like three other zucchinis that'll be ready to pick in a couple of days. So but I thought this was really beautiful. There's still the flower on the end of this. So yeah, pretty beautiful. So we will cut this up and uh, grill it tonight with dinner. So normally, um, for those of you just tuning in, um, normally I do talk about things that are going on in the world, but 
honestly, right now I'm a little bit too depressed to talk about it. Um, there are several reasons why I feel that way. One is that the events that have been going on recently are just so hard. Um, both being a physician with the Roe v. Wade um, being overturned and just thinking about the medical repercussions to women of that and then kind of right after hearing the news of that having many many children die in an act of violence right after a sort of racially charged act of violence happened it's just been a lot and it makes me really sad and I want this to be a reprieve from all of that, but I also feel like I need to mention it because I am a doctor and these things hit hard for me. You know, I was talking about the Roe v. Wade being overturned and I got a couple of nasty comments, which it's also just funny because I'm like, you do realize that if you leave a nasty comment, you are boosting that person's YouTube stats, but... Anyway, it's neither here nor there. Um, I got a couple nasty comments about it and it's just interesting because I don't think that people really understand the repercussions to women when Roe v. Wade is overturned and it's pretty dire. <laughs> um, so I don't know, there are these really amazing um, uh, needlepoint or they're not needlepoint it's embroidery patterns that I really like I can maybe try to find a picture but it's essentially a um, clothes hanger and then underneath it it says never again and it's referencing people trying to get abortions uh, by very unsafe means and lots of women die when things like that happen so all I will say is vote and it's really important. You just, you need to vote. Midterm, midterms are coming up and yeah, please register to vote. Anyway, um, with that, I will move on to talking about some finished objects. I have many. I have, so not counting the finished objects I have for my daughter, Edie. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep putting all of my sort of baby knits into a separate podcast that will be like baby knits focused. Mostly because before I had a child, I truly didn't really care that much about baby knits, which is kind of ridiculous. Baby knits are actually very fun. If you have any babies in your family, they're incredibly fun because you get the fun of doing a sweater project, but it is in miniature and can be finished so, so quickly. So I actually highly recommend them even if you don't have a baby in your immediate family, but if you have any friends or relatives having infants in their lives, they're actually like quite fun. But I'm gonna keep them separate. So I will just jump in. I have three sweater projects to talk about, which I'm like, what is happening? Um, but I've been gone for several months. So um, I have been working on a bunch of different things and have a bunch of whips to talk about too. Right now I am wearing the Rizzo top. I think that's what this is called. I can uh, correct myself if need be, but this is the Rizzo top by, um, Poison Apple Knits, Poison Girls Knits, I'm not sure. I will put all of the information, but this is a really, really amazing top. The only reason I don't wear it that much, I really like it under overalls, but it is quite short. So for reference, my belly button is like down here. So there are a good two or three inches. It's a good two or three inches above my belly button, which is fine, but I think, I originally had made this to be able to wear at work and it's definitely not appropriate for that. I used to have more of this yarn and it is knit top down so I could easily pick the bind off off and make it longer. Problem is, is I have no idea. I think I've used that yarn for various things. So I don't know, I might look around my scraps and see if I still have it, but I don't think I do. <laughs> I just think if it was a little bit longer, I would wear it a little bit more but I do really love it. And I actually have plans to make a couple more of these in some sock yarn that I have. It only took me two skeins of yarn, so it's a really affordable project. 
and I really love it. It's a really cool construction and it has this really awesome seed stitch with this eyelet pattern that is like kind of both conservative and sexy at the same time. So highly recommend. It's also just one of those patterns where as I was knitting it, I was like, what the actual fuck is going on? Like, I could not picture in my head how this thing was gonna come together until I was like pretty far into it. But it is a very well-written pattern. And if you just like trust it, things will go correct. So um, yeah, I really, really love it. It's a little bit hot for today. It's like almost 80 degrees here in Denver, but I wanted to wear some knitting. Now, on to my finished objects. The first one is my Sheep Camp sweater by Jennifer Berg. I love this thing. So this was knit out of Farmer's Daughter's Fiber in the in her Superwash DK base, which I'm not remembering exactly what the base is called, but I knit this in obviously two different colorways. So the contrast color is the Special Fancy Tiger Crafts, which is my local yarn store, one of many local yarn stores. It is their signature color from Farmer's Daughters, and it is this beautiful, so I think it's called like Farmer's Tiger or something like that, um, but you can only get it on the Fancy Tiger Crafts website or in their store. But I really, really was inspired by this. This is the second thing I've made from this yarn, and it reminds me so much of turquoise, which um, for those of you who don't know, the Farmer's Daughters Fiber and Jennifer Berg are both Native American women. And I, in the American West, um, turquoise is just a huge part of that culture. And so, um, I was really, really inspired by this. And then when I was at the store, I saw this other color, which is this really dark brown, almost black, but really dark brown color. And this is the, I think it's called Paul Newman colorway. And together, I just thought they looked so beautiful. And I will try to bring this closer. I feel like the, the uh, my phone that I film on really does not do this color justice but it is this turquoise color that has little specks of like orange and black and sometimes like a bright pink and it just reminds me so much of turquoise so beautiful i love it and i did have to make several modifications one thing that i really loved about this sweater is the rolled hem from the top i will put it on but it is extremely hot so um I did do a rolled hem at the top as it recommends, and then I did several modifications to the bottom. I will just show it to you. It obviously looks weird because this is very high and this is a little bit lower, but this is it. It's a little bit cropped. I love it. So I will talk about this a little bit more in my sheep camp sweater specific uh, finished object video that I will do. But I did several modifications in this, mainly because my, my gauge was pretty off. <laughs> so essentially what happened is most of the way through the yoke, I realized that this was going to be really small. And the problem was, is that it is, there's not, there, there comes a point in the yoke without giving too much away where you're no longer increasing anymore. And so what I ended up having to do is do some math in order to figure out how I could make this sweater the size that I wanted. Because what I really wanted is for it to be more of like an oversized cropped sweater that I could really just like throw on in the winter time and didn't want it to be like super fitted. And so I did that and you can actually see that this motif gets a little bit wider towards the bottom and that is different from, uh, from the original pattern. The other thing I did because I changed that is all of the numbers were like completely different for this sweater. So it's exactly as pattern until about here and then things went completely haywire. And I ended up knitting the sleeves, just kind of, I guess, work. 
and I did have to knit them a couple times. So like things do not always go as we expect them to with knitting. I know that I knit each, I knit one of the sleeves twice and then the other one just once because the first time I was really figuring it out and it was way too big. And so essentially what I did is I evenly decreased down the sleeve and I had extra of the color work at the top. And so I just did some really simple color work at the bottom of the sleeve and then a rolled hem rather than the rib that it calls for. So yeah, I really, really love it. It's so good guys. I'm like obsessed. I'm showing you the back. <laughs> It doesn't really matter, but I love it so, so much. It's oversized and super comfortable and it looks great with jeans. And I think I'm really, really gonna enjoy wearing it both at work. Um, I wear a lot of like high-waisted pants at work. So I think I'll really enjoy wearing it at work. And then also um, just like with a pair of jeans at home. So yeah. Sheep Cam Sweater by Jennifer Berg. I highly, highly recommend. I love it so much. I will say the yarn is gorgeous. It is divine, but I am not very used to working with superwash yarn. And I forgot how much it grew. In fact, I did all of these modifications and after I blocked it, it grew so much that I was like, probably didn't need to do that, <laughs> which is hilarious. But I ended up just throwing it, which, you know, I would not recommend this, but I ended up just throwing it in the dryer and it shrank right back up and now I'm really happy with how it fits. And yeah, it's really, really beautiful. I can show you my floats. I know some people like to see floats, but yeah, I highly recommend it. It is a great sweater. I think it would be a really perfect color work sweater, first time color work sweater. And in fact, I actually did this as a knit along with two of my friends and both of them it was their first color work sweater ever and it looks gorgeous so can highly recommend this as even a first time color work sweater it is beautiful i'm obsessed i want to make more i think it's something that um would be really good for giving away as gifts because it's just so beautiful and the fact that it's dk weight it just goes really fast so yeah, the Sheep Camp Sweater by Jennifer Berg. I love it. You will see this a lot more once it gets warmer. It's like a little bit too hot to wear right now, but I am going up to Steamboat for like a month and a half. So I should be able to wear it like at night. It still gets quite chilly at night there. The next sweater is a languishing whip that I picked up and finished. And this is my Forest Berry Jacket by Fable Knitwear. I think it's Helena of Fable Knitwear. I love this thing, so I will bring it a little bit closer. This is not totally finished. All of the knitting is done, but I do still have to graft the underarms because this is knit bottom up. And I also need to get buttons and sew them on. This sweater is a fingering weight sweater that is as I said, knit bottom up, and it has these two panels of cables and bobbles on either side. Oh, so good. I knit this out of Brooklyn Tweed Loft, their fingering weight, in the color sweatshirt, which is just a really beautiful gray that has little nets of black. I love it. It's so good. And this was pretty enjoyable to knit. I will say the one thing that is hard about this sweater is that you're having to cable on both the right and the wrong side, which is fine. But when I am cabling, I really, really rely on reading my knitting, meaning that I look at the row below and use that as a guide to not have to look at the pattern as much because oftentimes, um, cable patterns will repeat themselves over and over again. And once you get the sense of how the cable is supposed to move through the pattern, usually you can kind of drop the directions and just read your knitting. When it is cabling on both the right and the wrong side, you cannot do that because for instance, this is what the wrong side looks like. You can't, I can't read that. <laughs> so. 
that did make it a little bit of a challenge and that is why I set it down for a while is because I was just so sick of having to look at the cable, the cable pattern all the time. Um, but now that I finished it, I really love it. And because it's fingering weight, I think this is something that I will be able to wear to work quite a bit. I will put it on, but things are getting very, very hot here. So again, it will be very quick. And this is a little bit harder to show because A, the underarm is not finished and B, the buttons are not on. But this is what it looks like. This is obviously a much, much more fitted cardigan and I think you look amazing. I think this will look really, really sharp with the high-waisted pants that I generally wear to work. So I really love this. I think that the puff sleeve is very classic. I ended up making the puff sleeve a little bit bigger um, just because I knit a pattern by the same designer, the Diagon Alley Jumper, and I love, love that sweater. I wear it to work a lot. It has the same issue as this one where it's a little short. However, it's knit from the bottom up, and so I do have some of that yarn left over, but it would require me, like, grafting. <laughs> I just, like, can't bring myself to do it, so I just enjoy it for what it is. But um, with this sweater, uh, I noticed with the last sweater that the puff sleeve was not as exaggerated as I wanted it to be, and so I ended up just doing the, what, how this is made, which I don't feel like it gives too much away, is with increases. So. You increase and then you decrease back down. And so essentially I followed the pattern exactly as written except for making it a bit longer because I'm so tall and I knew from my last one that it was a little shorter than I wanted until I got to like here and then I just increased way more and then decreased way more. So um, yeah, this is really, really beautiful. I love the yarn. I think that having a really beautiful gray cardigan it is something I am gonna wear all of the time. All right, the last finished object I have, I will also have a little um, finished object video coming out about. And this is the Remunculus by Midori Hirose or Knit Cafe Midori. Everybody has knit this, I have already knit this this is my third one. And so this is not something new, but I wanted a more summery version of this sweater. So it is by no means like totally a summer sweater because I did hold mohair with it, which is what gives it kind of this like beautiful barley look. I'm obsessed with this. Also just like look at this drape. This is, I knit this out of Katja yarn in the, it's the Katja concept. It is, I think, 90% cotton and 10% cashmere in the artichoke colorway. And then I held it together with uh, Knitting for Olive in their, I think it was the Dusty Sea Glass colorway. And I love the fabric that this gave. I wanted to have a sweater that I can throw over in the late summer evenings, early summer mornings and have it be warm, but not like super, super warm. So that is essentially why I made this. I also think this is something that I'll be able to wear at work because I do get overheated easily. So like for me, it's quite challenging to wear like a really big woolly sweater at work. Um, so yeah. Hello. I had a baby wake now. I have a baby waking up. I'll be back. False alarm, but it could happen at any moment. Um, so I don't remember where I was, but this is um, a sweater that I've knit many times and I really love. And I honestly made very few modifications. The only modification I made is that with the cast on, I did not do the tubular cast on that the pattern recommends. I just did my normal tubular cast on that I do for all one by one rib. You can see here, I usually put a little piece of yarn in the back. That's the same yarn that the netter sweater is knit out of, just so I know what is the back because sometimes I hold it up and I'm like, those short rows look longer and then I'm wearing it and I'm like, nope, this is on backwards. So anyway, 
Um, this is knit out of a more summery yarn and a less summery yarn. Other than that, it is knit exactly to pattern. I did have one funny thing happen, and that is that as I got towards the end, I had four balls of the kache yarn, which is um, bricatia, I'm not sure, uh, which each ball is 50 grams, which normally having 200 grams of yarn would be enough, but this I think is a little bit more dense than normal yarn and so the yardage is shorter. And so I was definitely playing a game of yarn chicken. I think I ended up having like maybe two grams left and I failed at yarn chicken. So originally this, netter, this sweater, you knit um, these sort of balloon sleeves and then you do a five cord or sorry, five stitch I-cord bind off at the end. And my original was out of the same exact yarn that the sweater was knit out of, but I ran out of yarn. And so what I ended up having to do is rip back while the other one was still on the needles, use that yarn to like finish it off so they're same length. And then I just did the I-cord bind off in the mohair. So. For the majority of the sweater, I held one strand of mohair and one strand of the Katya concept yarn together. And then for the, the I-cord bind off, I held three strands of the mohair together. So let me just throw it on. It's gonna look weird because this is more of a um, wider neckline as well. Same with the sheep camp sweater, but this is it. I really love it. It is so comfortable. Sounds like uh, Edie is actually awake now. So I am gonna leave you there and I will be back to talk about my works in progress. I'm back and now I have iced coffee. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the whips I've been working on. Let me gather them really quickly. Right, I have so much to tell you about. So um, the first thing I wanted to tell you about is my spinning that I had done, which I guess this is not really a whip as much as a finished object, but then will become a whip. So I have spun two different skeins. The first is this Cordale. It's so delicious. I cannot wait to knit this. This is a light fingering weight yarn. And then I also spun up some Ramadale. Ramadale? <laughs> Yampa can't decide if he wants to be in the bedroom or in here. And Edie is trying to go down for a nap. So you're probably gonna hear that. But I spun both of these. And initially I thought that I would make this into a pair of socks. That's what I spun it for. So last time you saw this, it was um, on bobbins and this is a three ply. It actually turned out really well. So um, let me undo it here and just show, show you. So this is it. It's hanging really straight. It's really, really bouncy. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but I am really excited to knit with this. It smells really like sheepy. Um, but part of me thinks that it would be fun because I have both of these colors. And then in my breed of the month club that I get through um, the uh, Canadian um, yarn seller, the Homestead, um, I have also gotten some darker colors of yarn. And it kind of makes me wonder if I should save these and knit them all together into like a shawl or something like that. I think that would be really, really beautiful. So trying to decide what I'm gonna do, but at the same time, maybe what I'll do is I'll make some more two ply and then use the three ply for socks. I just think it would be really fun to have some hand knitted socks out of my hand spun. So as you'll see, and I'll show next, I'm almost done with a pair of socks that I've been working on for literally forever. So maybe this will be the next thing that I will cast on. I think it would be really fun to see this in 
a smaller circumference also because the Romneydale, Romneydale, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but whatever. The Romney? Maybe it's just Romney. I think it's just Romney. <laughs> anyway, um, it is a yarn. It's a wool that has many different colors that are kind of mixed together. So I think there could be some like cool kind of micro striping effect or like cool marling effect going on. So I think I've convinced myself that that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make these into socks and then I am going to keep this and hopefully knit this and my other hand spun into like a beautiful shawl of some kind. I think that would be really, really beautiful. So that is the plan. Now on to whips. I will start off with what I think is always the most boring whip and that is my socks. So I have been working on these despite having them on the needles for forever, but it's just because sock knitting is not my favorite thing. But this is the second sock. I've already finished the first sock. It is just a vanilla sock knit out of lamb strings yarn in the 2021 Christmas colorway that came with my advent calendar. And I got another advent calendar this year from, ooh, I think it's called Naughty Pine um, Fiber Company. And I got their artist one. So it comes with like, I think some ceramics and some candles and things like that. So I'm really excited. But anyway, this, is gorgeous. I really, really love this pink yarn. I don't know why I haven't finished these. I think I just haven't been in the mood, but I really want to finish these before we go up to Steamboat so that I can cast on another um, knit and work on another pair of socks while I'm up there. I have some fun self-striping. I might wind up too. I might wind up this hand spun pair of socks and some self-striping to do kind of both, maybe one for Sean and one for me, but love these. And I am housing these in my favorite project bag, which is my squirrel project bag that um, Kat of the Heather and Hops podcast made for me. And there are these amazing squirrels on the front. And I love it so much. Okay, the next work in progress I have, I'm kind of going in... Um, I have my handy dandy uh, notes because a couple of these I don't remember the name of, but this one I certainly do. This is the half and half triangles wrap. This is a pattern by Pearl Soho. I am knitting this out of the called for yarn, um, which is the linen quill. I did it in two different colors, the kiln red and poppy red, which I think is the original color that the pattern came in. But I finished the kiln red and then cast on with the poppy red. And, you know, I feel like a lot of people have had like a religious experience with this knit. And I must admit that I enjoy it. I think it's really squishy and I think it's going to be really beautiful. But I find it kind of boring to knit. <laughs> which I feel like I shouldn't say that. Oh, I'm showing you the back. I feel like I shouldn't say that because everyone talks about how amazing it is. And it is amazing. It's really fun. But it's also just so, so much knitting on a pretty small needle. So I'm not, you know, I'm just, I just pick this up when I need some knitting and I don't really know what to work on and I'm kind of in between projects. But it was really good to be able to add a little bit on and not have to think about it, not have to think about a pattern, just pick it up and go. I am really glad that I left this really bright color for last because it is really fun to knit with because it is so, so bright. So yeah, just knitting away at this. I did change it a little bit as a lot of people have done. I did the German short rows rather than wrap and turns, but other than that, I have not changed the pattern at all. Enjoyable, just not like the best thing I've ever done. Uh, but I also understand why some people really, really gravitate towards it because it does have this beautiful rhythmic simplicity that is fun to work on. I just think for me, I sometimes get a little bored. The next pattern I wanted to talk about is um, the Bolin, Bolan, Bolin? Tea by uh, Layla Raven. 
And I am knitting this out of Quince and Company Sparrow, which is 100% linen yarn, which this is really the first time that I've done a real foray into knitting with linen. And it's interesting, it's an interesting fiber. I highly, highly recommend if you have never knit with plant fibers, looking up Mel Make Stuff, I can put a link to her podcast where she talks about plant fibers below because she has incredible information on joins, kind of like weaving in ends, and then also just the various different plant fibers that are available. But I am knitting this um, Quince & Co Sparrow into the Bolan tee which I started just a couple of, like maybe a week ago, and I have not gotten very far. So this tee, what you do is you knit it in kind of four pieces, but you knit one piece, another piece, and then you seam the front and the back together. So imagine this kind of coming out here. But this is a tee, which I can put a picture up. It's really beautiful where the bottom of it is just stockinette, but it's knit sideways. And then the top is this really beautiful lace motif. And I have done the lace motif several times, but I still have many, many more <laughs> to go. So this is not the thing that I really, really love working on. I think just working with these plant fibers is honestly not my favorite thing, but I think this is something that I will wear a lot and I don't have very many summer knit items. And I feel really, myself when I wear uh, a, you know, at least one thing that's handmade by me. And so I would really like to keep working on this. So this will be one of the knits that I take with me to Steamboat. Sorry, it is very hard to record one of these when you have a newborn, turns out. I did want to talk to you about my last whip and then I think what will happen is I'll talk about the books that I read tomorrow and try to upload this tomorrow. This is it. It is The Yellow Cardigan. It is incredible. So what I've done since I saw you is I have grafted the top of the yellow cardigan together, cut both the steaks, and knitted two sleeves. However, this was the first sleeve I knit. And you can see it is much bigger than the second sleeve I knit. So I have already started kind of a Project Diaries video specifically for the Yell Cardigan. And so I'm going to put that out as soon as I'm finished with this. And I've been keeping track of kind of the process as I've gone. I will say that once I got done with this first sleeve, I was so excited and then I put it on and the sleeve was huge. I can show you really quickly. It was crazy. So this is the Marie Wallen sleeve. This is my heavily modified sleeve. Let me just show it off here. My sleeve, the other sleeve. <laughs> As you can see, it's huge. I think this is not a flaw in the pattern. I'm sure that this is just that my gauge is off, which I would like to say, I did a gauge swatch for this. So sometimes your gauge just lies, your gauge swatch lies, and sometimes things turn out differently than you expected. Overall, I really love the fit of this, but the sleeve, it just was not right. So I had to do a ton of modifications on my sleeve and I'm really, really happy with the second sleeve. What I actually ended up having to do is make the armhole much smaller. So there's a steaked armhole. So what I actually ended up having to do, which you could do on even a non-steaked, you could do this on any armhole, I think is I actually mattress stitched it closed. So there's a glare, but from about right here to right here is actually mattress stitched, which I think is incredible because you can like barely see that. But let me show you on the inside. So here you can see the steak and this part is where I mattress stitched from there to there. And that way I was able to make the armhole a lot smaller. And that meant that I had to completely change the way that the sleeve was knit. So essentially how the sleeve is knit is in color work, 
all over color work with some decreases throughout the sleeve. When I tried on the Yell cardigan and realized it was too big, what I did is I took some, um, what are they called? Uh, cable needles and I actually threaded the cable needles through the sweater to make it the circumference that I wanted it to be roughly. Then I took it off and I took a look at it and I saw that I needed to close the armhole by about an inch and so I did that and then I counted around and saw how many stitches I had and I had done that closing all the way to the sleeve the bottom of the sleeve so I knew roughly how many stitches I wanted to end with and how many I was starting with and then what I did is I just evenly decreased about every six rows and I did some other calculations I will go into all of this in the video that I'm going to be releasing about the yell card again but that is generally what I did is I literally just tried it on put some <laughs> markers in to show how much smaller I wanted it to be and then counted the stitches and re kind of configured the pattern based on that. It did mean that I had obviously less of the repeats each row and I also did one less round of repeats because I noticed that it was going to be a really long sleeve and then I just decreased evenly until the end and I really really like how it turned out. The other thing that I did differently between the two sleeves, which again, I'll talk about more in depth, but on this sleeve, what I did is I did the Weave and Steven technique for adding on new yarn. And it's really nice because you weave in all your stitches or all of your ends as you go, but it still leaves a lot of weird ladders and things like that. And that is entirely due to my tension. I just couldn't get it to look good. So what I did on the second sleeve actually is I spit spliced all of the sleeves, all of the stitches together. So as soon as I would be done with one, I would rip it, take the next color that I would be using for the next bit, take them apart a little bit, probably about two inches, spit in my hand and rub them together. And in that way, I made it so that I didn't have to weave in any ends on the sleeve, even though you're doing all of these color changes. <coughs> it was incredible. And there are times, like for instance, right here, you can see a little bit of this red coming in. Um, right here, you can see a little bit of that purple coming in there. There's probably a little bit of the light brown here coming in from down there. So you can see that for a couple of stitches, you can see it right here, there's some red coming into this blue section. So what ends up happening is that there's kind of a marl or a blending of the two colors for that two inches. And what it ended up doing is that in the under, the bottom of the underarm, there is some blending and there's some color that's being moved over to the next kind of bit of the pattern, but that does not bother me at all. It's on a part of the sweater that is underneath the arm that you're not going to see. I'm going to be the only one and now you guys know that it's there, but I thought this was just such a fantastic way to not have to weave in ends and actually to keep the tension looking really good. So. I am really, really proud of that, and I highly recommend doing that if you are working with rustic yarn and doing a lot of color changes. I mean, it literally made it so that I don't have to weave in any ends, except for like this end here, which I left very long because the other thing I did, I'm not really having any trouble with the bottom flipping up at all. It's laying very flat actually. And I think that if I do end up having trouble with this moss stitch flipping up, which some people have had troubles with that in the past, I will just put a ribbon or something like that. But I know that with the sleeves, I feel like I have more of a tendency for that to happen. And so I actually knit the moss stitch and then I switched to a smaller needle and knit the just a stockinette pattern and I'm go or sorry just a few stockinette rows and then bound off and I'm going to sew that down after it is blocked so that there's just a little bit of overlap and it makes it so that it will really pull this down and make it so that it doesn't um, flip up. I am planning on also doing something like that 
for the collar. So I plan on knitting quite a bit of extra stockinette and folding it in in this dark contrast color. Hopefully I'll have enough, um, but we'll see. <laughs> anyway, in order to make sure that it doesn't flip up, because from what I've seen from other people's projects, the neck band is really where that is like the worst of the problems with the flipping up of the um, small seed stitch border. So that is my yellow cardigan so far. I'm really excited. All I have to do now is rip out this first sleeve, which will be a little tedious. Um, I have to rip out the first sleeve. You can see right there. I marked where I have to do the Kitchener stitch up, or sorry, the mattress stitch up to close up the, because I was like, I'm gonna forget between the two sides. So I marked it on this one using the pattern, reading your knitting, so important. But I am just needing to unravel this and then I do still need to pick up and knit the entire collar and then I will be finished with my yellow cardigan. I am really hoping to finish this before I go up to Steamboat, which is only a couple of weeks from now. And the reason being is that I actually think this will be a really, really good layer to have while I'm up in Steamboat. Um, and also I don't want to bring all of the yarns up to Steamboat, but I'll definitely want to finish it. So. I'm hoping to get it done in the next couple of weeks, and I think that's doable. The R, the second sleeve only took me a few days to knit, probably like three days, so um, I'll do the other one and then uh, go from there. I have some other fun things on the horizon. I'm actually planning on knitting a gift sweater. Um, someone very close to me in my life is having a really big birthday coming up, and so I'm gonna knit her a sweater and I'm just waiting for the yarn to come in. I got some Fiber Company Lore in this really beautiful blue color, so I'm really excited to get started on that. And I will hopefully bring you guys along for the ride. And I am planning on uh, coming back on here and talking about the books tomorrow because like I said, just too much in one day. But I hope you're all doing well and I will see you in just a few seconds, I guess, for your timeline and tomorrow in my timeline. <laughs> Bye. All right, it is the next morning. I have my coffee. Let's talk about books. I have a huge stack of books to talk about. Oh boy. I have been doing a lot of reading and this isn't even all of them because a couple of them I have donated or sorry, I have given away to friends uh, or returned to my library. So let's start off by Sky talking about Sky Falling by Mia McKenzie. This was great. <laughs> I think this book wouldn't be for everybody because it doesn't really have like a clear plot. It's not a plot-driven novel at all. It's definitely a character-driven novel. And it's kind of a coming-of-age story about a woman who, when she was younger, donated an egg, or donated some eggs for money. And then the person that um, kind of was birthed out of that egg comes to find her later in life. And it's so good. I think the thing that I really like about it is the prose in general. I really, really love the way that this was written. And um, I also really loved the descriptions of Philadelphia. It's kind of is like a love letter to a city in a way, but also a really beautiful coming of age story about a kind of like early middle aged woman who is coming to terms with who she is and who she wants to be kind of going forward and what really matters to her most. It's really, really good. Um, and let's see, what else do I wanna say about this? It is Pride Month and there is some queer kind of um, lesbian rep in this as well. So yeah, really, really good. The next book that I read is They Never Learn by Lane Fargo. I gave this a three out of five stars. It is a thriller novel that is kind of like Dexter, but make it feminist. 
Uh, it follows a female professor at a college and she starts murdering men on campus who are doing horrible things to women. And it's great. I mean, I think for me, thrillers are not my favorite genre, but I do think that they're kind of a fun palate cleanser. And this one was interesting. It has all of the things that you want. Um, and I think it was also interesting to kind of be in the mind of the serial killer and like learning about who she was and the people who are in her life kind of learning more about what's going on. I don't want to give too much away because I feel like the best thing about thrillers is just like going in not knowing much. So just go into this if you have any interest knowing that it's kind of like Dexter, meaning that like the villain is murdering villains, which like... Let's not all pretend like that's okay. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I definitely do not believe in like the death penalty and things like that. So I think like we shouldn't be murdering anybody, but uh, I don't know, it's kind of fun. It's interesting. The next book I read is Ina May's Guide to Childbirth by Ina May Gaskin. This was a book that I talked about a bunch of different times because I've been reading it slowly over the course of my pregnancy. I am going to be passing this along to a friend. I think that there are some things that I really loved about this book and some things that I really did not like about this book. It essentially uh, is a nonfiction book about childbirth written by a midwife um, who was practicing in like the 70s to maybe early 90s. I don't remember exactly what her timeline was. It is good, but I feel like it is very dated, um, particularly just in that, like, she hates doctors. Like, that's the sense that I got from it is, like, does not like doctors, thinks that you should be questioning every single thing that doctors say, thinks that doctors have some sort of, like, crazy ulterior motive, which was hard to read as a doctor. <laughs> um, and I also think it's just, like, there are many things in this that were, like, blatantly not true, and so... I do think that this might kind of sow some animosity that doesn't actually need to be there. And like, it's better to realize that like, we are all on the same page. I also obviously am a physician who lives in a place that is more liberal and also had a medical education that's a little bit more liberal. So I don't know if this is something that maybe other parts of the United States, you would get this kind of experience with a physician, but like you definitely would not in Colorado. And like many, many physicians in Colorado have, including myself, have midwives deliver their babies. And so it's just a little dated. I also will say that there are some things that I think are actually pretty harmful in terms of how she talks about kind of questioning after birth care for the newborn. So specifically, she talks about like, not doing some of the interventions that we do, um, that I think are actually really important. So for instance, we give like a vitamin K shot. And that is um, because infants are have a deficiency in vitamin K. And this has led to hemorrhages inside their brains, which can either like maim them forever and like developmentally disable them forever or kill them. And so, you know, for me, I'm like one small shot in the thigh feels like a very small intervention to do to prevent something that catastrophic from happening. So, you know, there are things like that where I was reading it and I was like, this is not true. Um, another thing that I remember that has just really stuck with me is she talks about how it is dumb to test for gestational diabetes because there's no treatment for gestational diabetes, which is like blatantly not true. Um, there is treatment for gestational diabetes and it's really important to test for that in order to treat it. So I don't know. There are things like that where I was like, hmm, this lady does not know what she's talking about, but there are a lot of things that she does know what she's talking about. And the thing that I really liked about this was the first half of the book or so, it is just birth stories. So it's stories about positive birth. And for me, as a physician who has delivered babies, has seen a lot of deliveries, has seen a lot of childbirth, it was nice for me to have just like story after story of like positive, beautiful birth. Um, because that's not always what happens 
and like is not what happened for me actually but it was still nice so yeah i think i gave this like a two or three out of five the next book i read is love and other disasters by anita kelly um this was pretty good this is a romance novel that follows two characters who are both taking part in a baking competition so think of something kind of like the great british baking show um and it's two contestants who kind of like fall in love the thing that's really great about this is the representation in it so again it's pride month and the two characters in this one of them is bisexual and or pansexual and one of them is uh non-binary and so it's just really great representation i think that they did a really good job talking about um i think the non-binary character's name is london yeah uh talking about london and what their kind of body dysmorphia is and how that can relate to having sex with someone and kind of talking about what parts you have and things like that I also thought that um, Anita Kelly did a really good job talking about um, how people who are non-binary are kind of perceived by the world and just sort of using the wrong pronouns and things like that. And so I thought that this was great for all of those reasons. The thing that I didn't love about this, which honestly I have found in a lot of sapphic novels, and I'm trying to just like... I don't know. I have like several friends who are lesbians and I feel like all of my friends just like fall in love with their partners so fast and like move in so fast. And that is beautiful and valid and amazing. But when I am reading a story, I don't like the like love at first sight trope. I don't know why. What is it about me that doesn't like this? I just like don't think it's romantic. I think for me, it doesn't allow me to understand like what helped them fall in love or like care about them as characters enough to be like these people need to be together and so yeah I don't know this isn't that this like isn't a sapphic novel because um the main character one of the two people in this partnership is non-binary so um I don't think that they would consider themselves a lesbian because they don't consider themselves to be a woman and so I don't know why I started talking about that you know privilege my own I'm still learning I'm still growing but anyway it is a little love at first sighty and I didn't love that I really like the like friends to lovers and enemies to lovers kind of tropes and the sort of like love at first sight trope is not something that really like gets me super excited so for that reason, I gave this a 3 out of 5 stars, but I still highly recommend it, and I will be passing this along to a friend as well. Whew, oh my gosh. The next book I read is so, so good, and that is Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark. Whoa, this is intense. This is so good, but also like lots of content warnings. The next couple ones I have to read are like a lot of content warnings. So this is, I mean, just look at this cover. Oh my God. Um, I gave this a five out of five stars. It was incredible. It is a novella, so it's very short. It's only like just under 200 pages. And it follows kind of this alternative reality in which the Ku Klux Klan there was kind of like a spell that was cast and they made Ku Kluxes which are like monsters which people in the Ku Klux Klan are monsters um but these are like actual physical monsters so it's kind of like a fantasy horror about this band of people who are being hunted by the Ku Kluxes who say like, fuck that, and they go hunting the Ku Kluxes, and it's so good. Um, wow. I would say that the only thing I don't like about this is the fact that it is under 200 pages. Like, I wanna be in this world for forever. I wanna keep reading this. I just, I don't know. There's something like beautiful <laughs> about just like watching these people just like going out and just being like, we're gonna murder these monsters, and yeah, I don't know. It was great. It's so, so good. Um, 
written beautifully, has a, you know, packs a lot into a really small book and yeah, just incredible. I also listened to this, actually borrowed it from my library, listened to it, and then went to my local bookstore, the book bar, and bought it because I was like, that was fucking incredible and I want to make sure that this author gets money from me specifically. So anyway, highly, highly recommend, but look up content warnings for this because, um, I mean, it's a horror novel about Ku Kluxes who are murdering black people, but then the black people go and murder the Ku Kluxes. So like, there are a lot of content warnings in there. You should be prepared for that, but holy shit, is so good. It's so, so, so good. Um, I follow a lot of people of color as well on um, YouTube and a lot of like booktubers who are people of color and they have all recommended this as well. So like I am a white lady living in Denver, Colorado. Don't, you know, listen to my opinions because they don't matter. But a lot of people who I trust in the booktube community recommend this book as well. And it is written by a person of color as well. So, so, so good. The next one um, is similar. Uh, so also a book that um, I'm not sure was written for me, but I loved so, so, so much. Um, this was Long Way Down um, by Jason Reynolds and obviously like has won every award in the world and absolutely deserves it. Gave this a five out of five, 10 out of five. So, so good but also a lot of content warnings. This is a novel, which I have never read anything like this, um, but it is a uh, novel written in poetry. So I forget what that is called, but um, it was incredible. One thing I highly recommend, which this is similar to Ring Shout, I got this from my library and then wanted to make sure that I had a copy of it for myself. Um, but I highly, highly recommend reading this via audio because Jason Reynolds, who is a spoken word poet, um, reads it and it is divine, um, and heart-wrenching, but beautiful. This follows, which like, this might be a lot right now, especially after all of the gun violence that has happened. I touched on this a little bit, um earlier, but it is June 8th, 2022, and unfortunately, gun violence just continues to be a horrific um, thing that's happening in the United States, and we're not doing any anything about it, it seems like. Um, so this is kind of in the tales of a, a two, but many, many more than that, um, but two really... Um, horrific events in which um, children were killed at school and people of color were killed um, in Buffalo. And it's just been, it's been a really hard time. And this deals with gun violence. Um, it makes me think about that time when President Obama was talking about Sandy Hook, which like that essentially just happened again. And I remember him kind of wiping away a tear and saying like, and by the way, this happens on the streets of Chicago every day. And yeah, I mean, whatever. I, I'm not gonna get, <laughs> I don't wanna get into it because it's so, so sad. And I just like, as a mother and as a pediatrician, I just like cannot. Um, and as a person, like as a human person, I just, I'm so saddened, but this follows a boy whose brother is murdered um, by gun violence, and it essentially follows him. He decides that he wants to get revenge for his brother's death, and he lives on like the seventh floor of an apartment building and he goes in the elevator and rides down the elevator to the first floor to walk out and kind of avenge his brother's death. But at each floor, the elevator stops and a different person from his life who has been murdered 
because of gun violence, comes onto the floor or comes onto the elevator and talks with him. And it follows him kind of coming to terms with what he wants to do and where he wants to go. And oh my God, it's so, so good. I like cannot recommend this enough, but I do just want to say, you know, it is about gun violence. It's about a young boy being confronted with gun violence and the repercussions of that. And he has had many, many people die in his life to gun violence. And so know that and go into it knowing that it's a lot. Um, but holy shit, it's so good. I'm just flipping through it because there were so many things that I wrote in the margins and so many things that I underlined and yeah. I highly recommend it. I've never read a book like this before, um, but the author is incredible and he reads it so beautifully. And so if you can get your hands on the audiobook of this, I highly recommend, but if not, read it as it is and your mind will be blown. <sighs> Those are really the two like heavy, well, I have one more heavier book, but those are really the two like more heavy books that I've read. Um, the next book I read was The Book of Cold Cases by Simone St. James. And I think I gave this like a three out of five stars. This follows, so if you've read anything by Simone St. James, she has a very, I don't want to say formulaic, but formulaic <laughs> way of writing novels, which can be great, but it essentially always follows two timelines in like a spooky place trying to figure out a mystery and they converge in a surprising way. And that's what happened here as well. It was good, um, but it was kind of, for whatever reason, and I think maybe this is just because I've read, I think two other of Simone St. James books. I think because she writes kind of a similar story over and over again, that can be either really helpful for you because for me, I suffer from anxiety and I know that I like to watch the same TV shows over and over again because I'm not going to be surprised by something sad. Like I just know what's going to happen. And so for Simone St. James, that can be helpful because you're kind of watching it and you know that things are going to turn out in a way that you kind of recognize um, with a twist. Like I definitely didn't guess what the twist was, but it's a little bit formulaic. But this one just didn't quite meet the mark, I think, because I was like, I kind of knew that things were going to come together and there was going to be some sort of like weird paranormal thing. So, yeah, but it was great. It was very moody, very atmospheric um, and essentially follows two different timelines and then trying to figure out this mystery that happened in the past again with um, with thrillers, this is a thriller, I don't want to give too much away because I think the best thing about going into it is just like going into it not knowing very much. I would say with this thriller, again, I gave it another three out of five stars. Like I did like it. It's not like I didn't like it. It's just um, thrillers are not my favorite. I think they're good palette cleansers, but I'm not like, they're not, you know, beautiful and mind boggling. So the next book I read is... Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. Oh my god. This is so good. Um, this is a the first of a fantasy trilogy, but then kind of the first to like an opening of a huge fantasy world in which there are multiple different trilogies following different characters, but within the same kind of like magic system and same like general world. But this centers on Fitz, and Fitz is a bastard. And he is the bastard son of royalty. And in this world, royalty has magic powers and Fitz has that magic in him as well. So there are kind of two different magic systems that are competing within this trilogy. There's the wit and the skill. And the skill is related to the um, royalty and the wit is something that we're still figuring out, but it essentially involves being able to communicate and 
kind of control animals. And the thing that I love about this is they're wonderful animal companions. You are essentially following Fitz from when he is a very young boy being brought to the keep by his, gra by his grandfather. And his grandfather essentially says, take this boy. I'm not going to raise him anymore. He is the bastard son of the prince and I'm over. I'm done. And Fitz is kind of left there and he ends up being trained as an assassin for the royal family and it was so good it's beautifully written robin hobb is a woman and this is i just love fantasy written by women like i love everything nk jemison has ever done so i feel like i need to pick up more uh, and like rebecca roanhorse like i love that i loved um the poppy war like i just i don't know i mean i'm a woman so that's probably why i also love a lot of fantasy written by men like i have a tattoo for um a fantasy written by a man as well so i just love fantasy in general i think is what i'm getting at now suddenly anyway I really really loved this i have the second one it ends like uh, there's there's a little bit of like a heart-wrenching thing that happens at the very end and so i was like i need a break i need like just a second which i feel like is not giving any like too much away but yeah it's so so good i mean it's like delicious it's so good <sighs> um i think i gave this a four out of five stars but i know that as it goes on I'm sure it's just gonna get better and better because I'm gonna care more and more about all the different characters the next book I read is a memoir which it's very rare for me to read memoirs and like not to throw shade but I feel like the reason why I don't like memoirs is most of the time people have something fucked up that has happened to them and they want to write a memoir about it and they are not good writers but that is not the case for this book <laughs> this is Beautiful Country by Qian Julie Wang. And this was so good. I cannot even begin to describe how good this was. Definitely five out of five stars. I recommend this for everybody. Like I think that this, a lot, honestly like this and this should be required reading. Like 100% should be required reading. This follows a young girl, Qian, um, who moves from China to New York City in hopes of finding the American dream. So essentially her father comes over from China to the United States to New York City. And um, a, several months later, Qian and her mother follow her father to New York. And it follows the immigrant experience from an undocumented immigrant who is not Latinx, which is really interesting. So, you know, I've, I've read a lot of stories. Um, one of the best that I read last year is called Infinite Country. Highly recommend it. It is fucking amazing. And it is also only like 200 pages long. Incredible. I would show you my copy, but I just, I keep like giving it to other people to read because I love that book. But anyway, a lot of the undocumented experience that I have read comes from the Latinx community. And this was a beautiful rendition of the hardships that come with being an undocumented immigrant, but she is Chinese. So she has a different experience from what a Latinx person experiences. And it's about her growing up in New York and how hard it is and it is so hard i mean literally her parents go from being professors in china to working literally in a sweatshop in new york city which honestly i did not even know that there were sweatshops in new york city and Qian herself works in a sweatshop in new york city as a child as well and so there are things about it that are so heart-wrenching but so important for us to know about and particularly there is also a lot of discussion about racism um, towards the Chinese community. And me, as a white person, I continuously try to read books that um, make me open my eyes to other people's lived experiences, especially as a physician, I think. But honestly, as a human being, it is important to understand what other people are going through. And of course, I know that I will never understand what it feels like, what it, 
how hard it is to be faced with these horrible macro and microaggressions on the daily, but it is helpful for me to get a sense of that and experience it at least in some small part by reading books like this. Um, oh my God, it's so good. It's like, I, it's incredible. I highly, highly recommend it. It is beautifully written, beautifully written. Um, this was another one that I borrowed the audiobook from my library and I highly recommend it because Jian, um reads it herself and it is gorgeous. The other thing, other thing that I really liked about it is um, the fact that Xian reads it, there is some Chinese in this book um, and it's so beautiful to hear it from her voice and hear what the Chinese actually sounds like. So whew, this was so, so good. I don't want to give, <laughs> I don't want to like give it away because it is a beautiful story. It has a wonderful arc. It talks about a relationship between a mother and a daughter, a father and a daughter, being um, at a school, kind of the insecurities that come in, the fear, um, facing the healthcare system when you are undocumented, so many, so many beautiful things. Um, the last thing that I would like to say though, just come, this just like popped into my head because it does talk about um, the healthcare system is I just, general PSA that like, if you are undocumented, we do not care. <laughs> like, we do not ask you anything about that. We um, do not talk to any authorities. You can go to the doctor. You can have a primary care doctor. I am a primary care doctor for many, many undocumented folks in Denver, Colorado um, at uh, one of our clinics that is kind of like right in the center of a very Latinx community here in Denver. Um, but also a Vietnamese community in Denver. So I have both undocumented Vietnamese and um, Latinx uh, patients. And so you can have a primary care doctor. It's not that you just have to go to um, the emergency department if you are sick, like you can be taken care of. You just need to find um, an FQHC, so kind of a, um, uh, catchment. So my clinic that I work in is within the Denver health system and the Denver health system is kind of the, um, health system in Denver, Colorado that serves, um, underserved urban populations and, um, you can do it. I just want to put that out there. It's really important for you regardless of if you are documented or not, um, to, Take care of your health and it doesn't just have to be on an emergency basis you can have a primary care doctor i'm a primary care doctor um, who takes care of people regardless of where they were born so anyway that is beautiful country and it's so 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 amazing i have to return that i borrowed it from my friend but i want a copy for myself um sorry this is very long <laughs> The last book I read is Book Lovers by Emily Henry. It's so funny to like go back and forth between these like very intense books and then like romance and thrillers, but whatever. You gotta, I, I personally have to read from a bunch of different things. Otherwise I will get too sad or overwhelmed or bored, you know? Anyway, this is Emily Henry's third novel. I've read all three of them. The first one was Beach Read, and then it was People We Meet on Vacation, and this is Book Lovers. They're all great. They're all kind of bookish and amazing. At least the first and the third. People We Meet on Vacation, I don't think it's super bookish. But this follows two different uh, people, Nora and Charlie. And Charlie is an editor of books, and Nora is a agent for authors and it is about them kind of meeting coincidentally like uh it's about them meeting coincidentally in a small town in North Carolina South Carolina one of the Carolinas I know they're different but I don't remember which one this is in um it's about them meeting randomly at a small town and kind of enemies to lovers, but also just kind of like misunderstood. So essentially they both live in New York 
and there's a moment at the very beginning where they meet and they kind of clash and they don't really get along on a like working relationship and so Nora and Charlie both are just like all right like I'm leaving like bye and then they meet like five to ten years later in this small town and sparks fly even though they did not like each other the first time they met each other but it's not like full-on enemies like they're not like enemies they just like when they first met they had a bad first impression and now they're just kind of like ugh, you know like this guy but the thing that i really like about it is that Emily Henry's characters are really strong and this female character, Nora in particular, is a very strong, confident woman who is not going to compromise for anybody. I think that this could have gone one of two ways and I really, really like like the ending of it, which I don't want to give anything away, but the ending of it could have gone one of two ways and I really, really like the way that Emily Henry ended this novel. Thing, the other thing that I really liked about it, I think I gave this like a three and a half, four stars, um, is the banter. I was like laughing out loud. I was, you know, giggling. Like it, their kind of communication with each other and just like quips and like little, communi you know, comedic relief was fantastic. The other thing that I really liked about it is the sister relationship. So Nora is kind of dragged to this small town by her little sister who is pregnant and like needs a break essentially and the small town is kind of the center location of their two favorite novels and it I don't want to give too much away but it is Nora and her sister's like favorite novel takes place in this small town and so that's why they decide to go to that small town in particular and I just love their sisterly relationship. Like, it's so beautiful. They really, like, help each other, carry each other. Um, and that was another thing I really loved. I feel like this is a love story, obviously, between Nora and Charlie, which, like, I'm not giving anything away. Like, this is a romance. We all know, you know, that it's a romance. But it's also a love story between Nora and her sister. And I just, I really loved that. I thought that that was a really beautiful um a really beautiful part of the story. All right. The last thing that I want to talk about, sorry, this is going on for forever, is um, the book that I am currently reading and then my next book that I'm planning on reading. And they are both queer because like it's Pride Month. And I do stand by it. Like, I don't think that you should read um, queer books, books only in June or books written by people of color only in February, like you should be reading these books all the time. Uh, just evidenced by, you know, many of the books that I have been talking about are written by people of color. Many of them are queer. So I'm just like, read, read books by diverse people, diverse authors, about diverse characters all year round. But I also, with that caveat, read these books all the time, but do put, I'm just excited about queer books in June, you know, like I'm just, I'm ready. I'm like, I feel like I want to read about like queer love and like angstiness. Like I, I also always read, um, Call Me By Your Name, which is my favorite novel of all time, um, in June, but so I'm going to read that, which we'll talk about later, but I, that book is perfection. Um, if we had a boy, like I really wanted to name him Elio, but now that we have a girl named Edie, I'm not sure I can have like Edie and Elio. Like I just think that's like a little too close, but we'll see. Anyway, these are the two books that I am reading and I thought that I would talk to them about you and see if any of you guys want to kind of read along with me. So the first one that I am currently reading, I am about 150-ish pages into this, and that is The Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School. Look at this cover. It is so good. This is incredible. Um, so I, one of my favorite uh, queer booktubers, they are a queer Latinx non-binary booktuber named Adri of um, Perpetual pages. I can um, put their uh, YouTube channel down below. Incredible. I literally, everything that they recommend, I'm like, bye, bye. 
<laughs> like, I just don't even, don't even pesco. Just like, they have incredible taste. A lot of the queer books that I have read, they have recommended and they're all amazing. So, The Lesbian's Guide to Catholic School was recommended by Adi. And so is the next one that I'm going to talk about. This follows a, which I'm only, you know, a third of the way through it, but it follows a young girl. So she is like 15, 16, maybe like 16, 17 age. And she has to transfer from her school to a Catholic school. And the Catholic school, she is like the only person of color there. Like it is full of a bunch of white people. And it's essentially about her dealing with the fact that she's a lesbian, going to a Catholic school, and she was just outed at her last school by her best friend, by someone who she thought was her best friend. And so she is trying to be in the closet in her next school because she just doesn't want to deal with being outed and having everybody think that think things about her and gossiping about her like she just wants to kind of like be under the rug about everything and also like you're allowed to be in the closet like <laughs> you get to decide when you come out anyway but she goes to this catholic school because her brother has to go to this catholic school and her brother is getting in a lot of fights and things like that and it has beautiful relationships with her brother it has really fun like banter between herself and her brother and herself and other people but also touches on some really intense topics for instance like the fact that while her parents love her so much um her mother in particular probably would really not be okay with her being a lesbian and so she is like saving money in case when and if she decides to come out to her mom if her mom kicks her out then she has some money to fall back on it also touches on the fact that her father was deported. Um, he lives in Mexico now, and so they have a lot of beautiful conversations over FaceTime, but obviously he can't be there with her to help care for her, and she has a really, really beautiful relationship with him. Um, and it talks about a lot of racism and a lot of microaggressions and macroaggressions that happen to her. One of the, the interesting microaggressions that I just loved is... Um, well, I mean, I didn't love the microaggression. I want to be clear about that. But I loved her response to the microaggression. She is at, like, a high school party. And this, like, white boy is, like, drunk and hitting on her. And he's like, oh, like, your name is Yamilet. Like, that's so, it's so exotic. It's so beautiful. And he's like, do you speak Spanish? And she's like, yes. And he's like, will you say my name in Spanish? And she's like, Connor. <laughs> which I just think is hilarious. Like, it says in there, like, I said as white as I possibly could his name, Connor. <laughs> so funny. Anyway, um, super angsty, super wonderful. Um, I think there's going to be a little love story in here as well. Um, and yeah, so good. It starts off literally, this is the title of the first chapter. <laughs> Thou shalt not trust a two-faced bitch. <laughs> it's like, it's hilarious. Anyway, this is already so good. I'm guessing it's going to be a five out of five stars if it continues on like this because I am enthralled. And the next book that I am planning on reading is A Lady for a Duke by Alexis Hall. And this I will, again, guide you towards Audrey's uh, Perpetual Pages page because they are the ones who recommended this to me. But this follows two people. It is kind of like a second chance romance. So essentially it follows a um, woman who is a trans woman who essentially during a war, she is in a war and um, at that time is not living as her true self. And she kind of takes the opportunity of people assuming that she died in the war to transition and live as herself. And then she discovers that her best friend from before she transitioned is having a really hard time dealing with a lot of depression and she kind of re-meets him and it's kind of about these two people falling in love and as Audrey puts it it's like the ultimate second chance romance because it's literally as if like your best friend came back from the dead and yeah I obviously haven't started reading this yet but I have heard that it is absolutely incredible 
obviously like the main heroine is a trans woman so it's I think gonna be really really important and fun you know just a fun romance to read during the month of June I know that there are um, some content warnings so maybe I'll read the content warnings for both of these so for the lesbianist guide to Catholic school the content warnings for this which I just love that the authors like these newer books are having content warnings in the beginning for people but so for this one this book deals with issues of racism, homophobia, immigration, and the suicidal ideation and hospitalization of a character. I've done my best to depict these topics with sensitivity and care. If these are difficult subjects for you, please take care of yourself and know that your mental and emotional well-being comes first. And then for this one, the content warnings, content guidance. Some characters who knew Viola, who is the main character, some characters who knew Viola before her transition refer to her dead name or use male pronouns when speaking about her in retrospect. But in keeping with the conventions of the period, this is only in the form of surname and title. Gracewood has a disability to which he and others will occasionally refer using ableist language. There are some references to his suicidal ideation, as well as references to drug and alcohol abuse. Some language has been modernized for tone, voice, and readability. So, yeah. I am so excited for this. I haven't even started it, but I'm like itching to open it up. And I just finished reading Book Lovers, so this is kind of like my next physical TBR. So, all right. I've been talking for so long about books. This is going to be like an actual movie that I have to edit but it's fine I don't I barely edit just for for all of you like you can film a podcast I literally have my phone balanced atop a I almost like want to show it but I have my phone balanced atop a planter on my kitchen table and I'm just sitting next to it and then I will just edit this on uh, iMovie on my iPhone and I do barely any editing and get it out there. The longest thing that it takes is just to like upload it onto YouTube. But anyhow, I hope that you're all doing well. I hope that you're taking care of yourself. I hope that you are reading something beautiful, crafting on something beautiful. And hopefully I'll talk to you soon. Hopefully not so long. I feel like the fact that I took forever to uh, record this is why it is taking me fucking forever to get through all of these books. But it was so fun to reconnect with all of you, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves.